intelligence of the individuals concerned. That has happened on both sides of the House, and I share the noble lord's view. Several Labour ministers have moved across to jobs related to their political experience. Dick Marsh was Transport Minister from 1968 to 69 and later Chairman of British Rail. Ted Short, later Lord Glenamara, was Postmaster General from 1966 to 68, then became Chairman of Cable and Wireless. And Eric Varley was first Energy Secretary, then Industry Secretary from 75 to 79. He's still Chairman and Chief Executive of Colite. What we're dealing with here is a very special case. This government has made a virtue of attempting to privatize a large number of industries. Uh, these industries, having been put back into the private sector, now have former cabinet ministers sitting on their boards. The government is still responsible for regulating, in many cases, what are monopoly industries, such as British Gas uh, and, uh, to a certain extent, British Telecom. And yet, at the same time, we have ex-cabinet ministers now sitting on the board. Labour points out that there are already strict rules binding civil servants moving to the private sector. They argue it's even more important that politicians not only are, but are seen to be above board. And Perkins in Westminster. Now, one of Europe's finest art collections is tonight almost fully on display for the first time. From this week, the Courtauld collection is housed where Turner dreamed his pictures would hang. It's in the building which since then has been more famous as a home to Britain's bureaucracy of birth marriages and deaths, Somerset House, in the heart of London. In the new gallery, there are pictures by Rubens and Botticelli that haven't been seen in years. The Queen Mother is opening the new Courtauld as we speak. In an uncharacteristic British show of flamboyance, £10 million has been spent on the building to give the formerly cramped Art Institute space to flourish as a major international study centre. Our arts correspondent Fiona Murch went along before tonight's opening to look at what's likely to become one of the artistic draws in the city of London. A seemingly perfect symmetry, a famous building for a famous collection. The group of Impressionists and Post-Impressionists seen by so many in reproduction, yet by so few in the original, form the heart and the basis of the collection. They were the gift in 1931 of first benefactor, the textile magnate Samuel Courtauld, who dreamt of an institute where art history would be studied alongside a marvellous collection. It's taken 60 years to find premises suitable for housing both, and over the years the collection has grown and been balanced by masterpieces of different ages. Only a third of the Courtauld's treasures could be displayed at any one time in its former cramped quarters in Woven Square. Now nearly all of them will be on show, a relief for the organisers after 11 years of planning. And there was a time when we wondered whether we'd make it at all, or whether just the galleries would come, or whether, as we all hoped and wanted, that the Institute and the galleries would move here. That was the logical solution, but in this world, the logical solution is not always the one that's achieved. But it has been achieved. We are under one roof, and we are delighted to be in this marvelous uh, neoclassical building. It's absolutely right for us. Somerset House is one of Britain's finest examples of neoclassical architecture, and as former home of the Royal Academy, seemed a perfect solution to the Courtauld's problems. Once the Registrar General had moved out in the early 70s and the Tate Gallery had decided not to move its Turner collection in. But the cost of converting this place of bureaucracy back to one of its original functions, a home of art, proved to be more than treble first estimates, totalling over £10 million. I think if you don't try for the best, uh, you don't uh, achieve anything worthwhile. And uh, we knew we had to do it. We knew we had to find a new home, we needed more space, both for the Institute and ourselves, and half measures would be uh, pointless. 
But ironically, the expensive dedication to historical accuracy in restoring the building has irritated some art critics who feel that it detracts from the art. Considering the Courtauld collection covers from very early primitive Italian, plus Neverland, you know, Nordic, northern art, right the way through, and also we're going to show some contemporary British art like Hoyland and so on. Well, considering that, um, to get really stuck into a sort of 18th century verite or truth is not helpful. So you're not happy with what they've done for the paintings? No, I can't concentrate, and I think it's very, very important to feel relaxed with paintings. I think paintings must be accessible. If they're too high up, if they're crammed together, you, you find yourself, in a way, unable to think. And I'm not saying thinking just in terms of being a court old student or someone who's an art historian. I mean, in terms of everybody, everybody's sort of the accessibility of art. So in this battle between architecture and art, do you feel that the architecture has won and that the paintings have lost? Well, I don't even know whether the architecture has. I think through the decor and interior has won. Maybe the paintings get in the way slightly. Uh, but I feel that the, the notion of using that building again is a triumph and uh, using it for sort of something that the public can visit and actually appreciate. That is a triumph. But the paintings have lost unfortunately. Whatever the criticisms of the showcase, everyone is agreed that residency in Somerset House will give greater prominence to a magnificent collection and contribute to every gallery's goal of attracting more visitors. Fiona Merch reporting. Tonight's main news again. Confidence is growing in the city that the government will take Britain into the European exchange rate mechanism by the autumn. The reappearance of the arch opponent of ERM, Sir Alan Walters, was, said Mrs Thatcher in the Commons today, the return of a friend of the family. Firefighters have managed to board the crippled supertanker Megaborg in the Gulf of Mexico, but there is still a major threat of pollution. And Boris Yeltsin's Russian Federation has voted by a massive majority to confirm its bid for sovereignty. On this program, Mr. Yeltsin said he wanted to work with Mr. Gorbachev and had a new plan for economic reform, which he will unveil tomorrow. But for tonight, that's Channel 4 News. Good evening. forget you can catch up on the latest world news every weekday morning at 7 and 8 on the Channel 4 Daily. Now comment which tonight comes from VJ Amritraj. <laughs> this year I will be playing my 20th British tennis season. It won't be my most successful though I hope it will be the best I can do this time around. I was reminded of this yesterday when I saw England's disjointed start to the World Cup. It wasn't just an off day, but more a question of them not taking a gamble when they were ahead. Strangely enough, this also happens to British tennis players whenever they are in a strong position. Although it was an American who said, winning is not everything, it is the only thing, most Western and Eastern Bloc countries take that view nowadays. Yet, in Britain and the Indian subcontinent, we have, it's not the winning that counts, but the taking part. I do not know to what extent the Indians inherited this instinct from the British, or vice versa, but only an Indian or a Brit has said to me after I have lost a very tough match, don't worry, old chap, let's have some tea. Now that is the attitude problem. Why should Britain and India pretend 
that winning doesn't matter on the one hand, while picking on the losers on the other. Why not drop the hypocrisy? I love tennis and want to see it flourish and produce better players. Real competition is honest. It sharpens skills and takes the game to incredible heights. Pretending otherwise is phony. It creates ambivalence. It dulls the spirit. It divides people into goodies and baddies and even lands a few of both persuasion on the psychiatrist's couch. I am not a hawk, nor do I relish the killing fields of sport, but everyone must be encouraged to go for gold. Sport is a great equalizer because when you're competing, it doesn't matter who you are, what your background, color, or religion. The common language is the desire to be the best. What matters is that split second that makes the difference between winning and losing. Let us not be afraid to show that we have the overwhelming desire to win. With that sort of honesty about, who knows, it might even stop the political hijacking of sport. If sport and politics do mix, though it is preferable that they do not, but if they must, let us use it positively to communicate between nations and bring about better relations through the wonderful medium of sport. Imagine the British cheering the Americans, the Russians, or heaven forbid, even the Indians. Sport could do it. Now looking at the weather, tonight will again be mostly cloudy with some patchy rain or drizzle in the far northwest and an occasional light shower near the East Anglian coast. Though it'll feel cool with that northerly breeze, temperatures won't fall very far overnight. Tomorrow will be much the same with cloud everywhere and some drizzle or showery rain in the north and east with the best of any bright or sunny intervals in the south and west. Temperatures will remain cool for mid-June, especially in coastal districts facing that chilly northerly breeze. And looking ahead to Thursday, only a very gradual change towards brighter and warmer weather. <laughs>